I grew up on a 26-acre horse farm out in rural Ohio. Growing up, I was a loner and preferred reading books to talking to people. I only ever had a few girlfriends, if middle school even counts, and didn't really put in the effort to actually have a relationship with much of anyone besides a few close friends. My parents had gotten divorced when I was young. I lived with my mom and saw my dad every other weekend. This did have an effect on me growing up, mainly that I had a hard time knowing what a healthy relationship looked like and didn't really have time with dad to have a healthy male role model. Mom had a series of boyfriends, some of whom were physically abusive to my brother and me. I remember getting backhanded across a room at 10 by one of them or being belted anytime anything at all was out of order. Another one used glue traps for the mice in the garage and made us watch when he'd cut them off the traps, which he'd do by cutting all their legs off before throwing the still-living, legless mouse in the trash can. That was a real gem. I learned very quickly to just keep my mouth shut and act generally pleasant because anything else might get me punished. This also made me develop an unhealthy attitude of just grin and bear it, I don't have issues, and if people were bad to me, I'd just take it. Whenever I could, I would recess into myself and my books. I was a voracious reader and had over a thousand books on five double-stacked bookshelves in my bedroom. I'd hide in there in the winter, once all the chores were done. Anytime the weather was good enough, I'd be outside, reading in the forest, out in the hay field, and spending a lot of time in the old cemetery across our field. It was beautiful, but looking back, it was probably not the most healthy lifestyle. Sorry for the backdrop dump, but through some therapy, I've come to realize that my upbringing put me in a vulnerable spot for staying with an abusive partner. My hang-ups and coping mechanisms just led me to tolerate a lot of intolerable behavior from people. L and I met when we were in our mid-teens, at a church lock-in that neither one of us wanted to be at, of all things, and hit it off right off the bat. She was one of those mid-zero-zero's quirky girls, writing weird poetry, yelling spork, all the standard stuff at the time, and decently attractive with curly hair. She came up and challenged me to an air hockey game, and you know how the rest of that story goes. We dated pretty much exclusively for the next seven years. We finished high school together, went to the same college, and even got the same scholarship to attend the same local state college. We had our ups and downs, but I put that down as just how relationships must be. She was erratic at the best of times and tried isolating me from the few friends I had because they were jealous of her taking all my time. She'd cry over the smallest stuff, hit me when she was mad over things I had nothing to do with, and just generally pester me to shower her with love. She needed constant validation from everyone around her, and she wasn't too shy about trying to get it. I put up with all this because she was my first real girlfriend, and she was great at just minimizing her bad behavior into something I was just too dumb to get. I'd just think she was being irrational, but I would put up with it to get back to our normal lives. College was where the more obvious red flags started coming. Within a few months of her coming to college, she was constantly hanging around with other dudes in our dorm, the honors dorm, there were all male and all female suites that shared a building. I would ask if we were still good and get positive answers, but then find her sitting on some guy's lap in his room later that same night. Multiple times, I caught her making out with randoms and just generally behaving inappropriately with guys. After I told her everything I'd seen and threatened to break up with her if she didn't tell me the truth, it came out that she'd given one other guy oral, which she described in excruciating detail. She said she was obsessed with him because, no lie, he looks like the guy from Napoleon Dynamite and is just really hot. Yes. We should have ended everything we had right there for that comment alone, but we'd been together for nearly five years at that point, so I thought we could fix things and reconcile. I confronted the guy, she cut off contact, and things got better for a bit. I ended up getting a decent job with a local construction company my junior year of college and saved up enough in six months to make a down payment on a house. This was in 2008 in an older steel town, so housing values were pretty much rock bottom. I talked it over with Elle, and we decided to buy a house fairly close to our school and just start our lives together while we finished college. We also got engaged shortly after moving in. I thought that by removing her from the co-ed dorm, I'd fix her cheating issues, and it really did seem to work for a bit. All in all, it seemed like life was looking up. There were some good years for a while. She got a job selling books, then went on to earn a graduate degree. Actually, she tried for four different graduate degrees but kept quitting because they weren't what she wanted to do. I paid for the ones she couldn't get a scholarship or student loans for, and I just generally supported her and her decisions. We have a dog and some cats. I kept working at that same construction job for a boss I hated, but it paid the bills. We got married in 2010, when we were 23. 
Kids, don't get married young, you don't know what a good relationship is yet. I want to get across here that it was exactly what I thought the good life was. I'd get up early, give her a kiss, and head into work, where I'd occasionally get reprimanded for not reading my boss's mind. I'd do drafting and job takeoffs, or go to a job site and wear myself out doing whatever work they needed, since it was a small business and everyone wore a lot of hats. Then I'd come home, let the dog out, and listen till Tack talk about her day. If I complained about my day, I wasn't being manly enough and was just adding to her stress, so I'd just start making dinner or mow the lawn, whatever. Rinse and repeat. I thought this was completely normal and maybe even better than average. The wheels really started to come off, though I didn't know it for a while when Elle got a new job with a local energy company doing mapping. She was finally making more than the minimum wage and was only there for a few months before her boss took notice of her. I don't think it was four months before suddenly she's getting a job as a process assistant in a large nearby city which was a two-hour drive for her. I'm not sure of the details, but within those same few months she started an emotional and eventual physical affair with her new boss. I still don't know what to think of this since the guy was 30 years older than her, was recently separated from his wife and was literally living in his mom's basement. I noticed she was withdrawing more than usual from the relationship but I figured it was the stress from a big corporate job and the drive. I tried putting in more effort, surprising her with gifts and stuff but nothing really landed. Again, I just figured she'd get used to the work and things would go back to normal. In January 2013, we moved to Cleveland to be closer to her work. I found a new and much better job, we got a really nice place for less than market price, and everything was shiny again. Sure, she had to work really late, quite often, but you know, that's corporate. She'd gotten a pay raise for her excellent work. Elle was making new work friends and was finally coming out of her shell a bit. Elle also started going out with work friends a lot and quickly started staying out very late and coming home drunk as a skunk, which led to more than a few fights between us. Things deteriorated and again, we just settled into a new equilibrium where we talked less to each other and when we did talk it would be the most milquetoast of topics. In December 2014, we went down to see her parents in Texas and had a great trip. It really seemed to rekindle some of those feelings we'd been missing and it really made me realize that things were more messed up in our relationship than I thought. When we got back, I had a real moment with Elle where I told her that I really had a great time and wanted to keep being as invested in each other as we were on the trip. I felt like I had a kind of epiphany where I knew we could change our relationship for the better and I was inviting her to help me with it. She screamed. Straight up, she looked at me with panicked eyes, stuttered, scrawled, and ran away down to the basement. I followed, trying to figure out just what I had said that would have led to that reaction, which led to her accusing me of cornering her in the basement. I backed off and she, through tears, told me that she didn't deserve love. I'm trying to ask her what this is about, get nothing from her, and we finally just go into separate rooms to calm down. The next day I tried to bring it up, and she told me in no uncertain terms that none of that happened, and if I bring it up again, she's leaving. Straight up, she denied that she freaked out and that we had even seen each other the day before. I obviously got really suspicious that something was up after that point, but I didn't really think it was cheating. It was more just that she was being insecure. She'd always been very insecure in general, just never to a level that made her freak out like that. After that episode, I decided that my teenage self was correct and that having a roommate who is occasionally funny and sometimes sleeps with me was about as good a relationship as I would ever get. I had a prejudice against divorce after seeing how my mom's life turned out afterward, so I decided I'd just make this work however I could. The staying out, drinking, and random outbursts kept going on her end, and I decided to just never bring up my feelings unless she asked directly. Meanwhile, I decided to work on myself first to be a better, more interesting partner. I started building up my home gym, working out, and getting into backpacking and woodworking, things that I kind of liked but never had time for. Elle had complained that I had no hobbies and wasn't interesting enough for her around this time, so I took her at her word that this would help more than actually talking about our issues. This is one of the few good things that came out of the relationship, as I'm still pretty physically fit and look much better than ever before in my life. Plus, my woodworking and turning have turned into a lot of useful life skills. Day was in April of 2015. She came home from a night out with the friends insanely drunk. I'm still not sure how she made it home. She threw up multiple times while I held her hair, then passed out on the floor by the toilet. She was so drunk she would breathe in these odd gasps, and I thought she was just going to stop breathing at one point. I thought about calling an ambulance but just decided to wait it out a bit. 
She had her phone beside her on the floor and it kept getting texts which I ignored for a while. I finally thought it was probably someone checking to see if she got home okay, so I decided to open it with her thumbprint and respond. The texts are all from her boss and the last one was something along the lines of you only went home because you're mad. I made you stop. We can't do it in the office anymore, F will catch us. I immediately understand what is happening and feel like the stupidest dude ever that I didn't put it together at any point in the last two to three years. I still feel dumb about it. We were young but that's no excuse to be so naive and check out your marriage. I had always just assumed we had grown distant but I had never once thought of cheating on her and just assumed she felt the same way. I start going through all her texts with him and see that this has been going on for a while, though it's unclear when it went from being an EA to a good working relationship and then again when the physical stuff started. I did find a message from earlier that same night, between picks down her shirt from the bar where they were at, where they were talking about the next time they'd meet up, just a week or so away. I decided that if I tell her anything at this point, she's going to flip it around into me snooping and misreading or misremembering what I read since I have a terrible memory guessing now that was just her gaslighting me to cover up her own indiscretions. Instead of confronting her, I go out and buy a voice recorder and spend a few days placing it in her car before work to find a good hidden spot and test how long it can record. I also scope out where they're planning on meeting up so I can find it that day. The day before the meetup, she told me she needed to go to a separate nearby town for work and that she'd be late coming home. I tell her it's fine and take your time coming home. Inside, I was all nervous, but apparently held it together enough to keep her from being suspicious. The hours pass, then around 6 p.m. I head out and drive to a spot near the bar they're meeting at, and wham, there they are. Both were in her car, pawing each other and making out. I just drove away, went home, had some shots, and cried. She came home later that night, and I didn't say anything about it, she just made us some dinner. She was all bubbly about how well her meeting had gone and thanked me for being understanding. After she went to bed, I went out and got the voice recorder, listened through it, and heard her begging to go back to their office to do the deed, amongst other things. I couldn't even figure out how to react, she was never like this at home and sounded nearly deranged in how much she wanted to be with him. I listen through this all, go in and wake her up, and tell her we need to talk. I ask if she's cheating and she denies it. I ask her about the name of the bar she was at and she denies even knowing what it is. I tell her I was there earlier today and saw some interesting things, she immediately asks if I followed her, how I could, and is there a tracker in my car? You have to tell me. I'm going to have a panic attack. You can't just track me. Again insane. I tell her I read her texts from a few weeks ago and went to the bar where she said she was meeting S, her boss. This turns into opening her phone to show me no such texts exist anymore, which I think she thought would negate the fact I went there and saw them. So crazy thinking about it. Finally, she says that yes, she's been seeing S, they've been together a few times, and, finally, if I make her stop seeing him, she won't love me anymore. Somehow, this works on me. I had no self-confidence, didn't like divorce as an institution, and figured being with someone to split the bills was better than being alone. And for a few months, that was it. She'd have meetups with him and I would try to talk her out of it. There were crazy moments, S had other girlfriends and L knew about them and got jealous of them. One time she came home sobbing and I hugged her while she told me that she thought S was breaking up with her for someone else. I just went inside. I don't think I felt anything other than a kind of ironic humor in it, like an eye-rolling feeling. I still don't know why I stuck around after that. And, of course, they kept seeing each other. Around this point, she also started having ONS with random other guys. I found out about a few of them over the years, and I suspect there are a few more. Finally, I drove myself into having a panic disorder and decided enough was enough. I gave her the voice recorder and demanded she break it off with S and record herself while she's telling him or me that I'm out. She cries but finally relents. The next day she did what I asked. When S found out, I knew he immediately panicked, and I got to watch those texts come in on her new Apple Watch that she didn't realize doesn't delete texts that you remove from your phone. Things settled a bit, and we went to marriage counseling for a session. I agreed to not tell the counselor about her infidelity this session as the condition for L to even go. The counselor then spent the whole session telling me I was smothering L by wanting to go through her phone and know where she was, which I only started doing after the cheating. We never went back. That was 2015 to 2016. After that, we stayed together, and about twice a year, I'd find some new infidelity. 
Once she was drunk and did oral surgery on a guy she works with in the bathroom. Once on a work trip out of state, she started texting a guy and started the weirdest EA I've ever heard of. A decent chunk of his texts were about how his grandma had to wipe his butt until he was in his mid-teens and he liked it. The whole time I just got used to pain shopping, it almost became a game for us, where she'd find out how I found out, would swear to stop seeing, talking to, screwing so and so while also disconnecting her Apple Watch or not using her car, etc. Looking back, I just kind of got used to it. I checked out of the relationship in any real sense. Funny enough, we'd have fights about me not being invested in the relationship during this time too. I finally had enough when I got a message out of the blue from one of her co-worker's wives and she'd caught her husband and L texting and snapping. She sent screenshots of them to me and said that she wanted me to know. The screenshots really drove home to me that L wasn't just prone to straying or making mistakes over and over. I know, I know, it's dumb, but when you're in a relationship, if you excuse one thing, it gets easier the next time, and I had gotten to the point of excusing everything. We'd have our ritual fight over it, she'd end the affair, and the cycle begins again in a few months. In the screenshots from N, L was saying things like, I should have done you the first time I saw you, is setting up meetings, etc. I confronted L with the texts, and her first reaction was annoyance that the guy didn't hide it from his wife better. It blew my mind, and when I was talking with N, it was obvious she was crushed. They had two kids, and her husband's actions were likely going to tear the family apart, and here's my loving wife mad that he was too dumb to hide it properly, and she knew he couldn't handle this sort of relationship. N sent me some texts later on, after the affair was in the open, with L telling the guy that there's basically a code of conduct for cheaters, and this guy didn't follow the rules. I snapped out of it. I finally felt awake after six years of affairs and ten years of just general abuse and incoherence. I moved into the finished half of the basement, slept on an air mattress by my gym, and started drawing up dissolution papers. I figured if the dissolution failed, I could always hire an attorney and get a divorce. I ghosted Elle as hard as I could being in the same home, 100% grey rock. Elle started lovebombing me in her own weird way. One time I got home from work, and she'd bought a lamp for the basement and put it by my air mattress. It's probably the sweetest thing she's ever done for me, lol. To drive home everything, a few days later she's working from home in the afternoon and doesn't hear me go into the kitchen for a drink. I can hear she's on speakerphone on the couch and it's S, still her boss and the guy all of this started with. I hear him ask if she's alone and she says yes. I think, really? Really? Right now, as I'm preparing the dissolution, in the same house, she's going to indulge this guy. I creep closer and listen in. He starts talking about how he's never done it in a car in an automated car wash, and he thinks that would be fun. WTF. Just like, where does she find these guys? I just walk in, get behind her head on the couch, and yell, hi S. Nice hearing from you. L jumps and nearly falls off the couch, S just immediately hangs up, and I laugh and go to put on my shoes. L yells, that was rude. I laugh again and get my coat. L asks where I'm going and I say out. I must have said it in a way where she finally got it that we are done, we have been done, and now I just wrap it up. She runs up and blocks the door. I tell her to move, and she gets this weird little smile on her face. I still remember it. Like all this was still a game, that if she blocks the door then I'll just have to stay and we'll still be married, that her plan to keep me by physically blocking the door has no chance of failing and I'm just stuck now. I grabbed her by her shoulders, picked her up, and moved her. Just feet off the floor, right over to the side of the door, then gently back down on her feet. I told her if she tries to keep me here, I will take her apart, because I don't have it in me anymore to deal with her, and all the anger I'd been pushing down my whole life was still right there. I had never touched her violently and still never have, but that was the closest I got. I drove off to one of my favorite local bars and hung out with friends I'd been making for the last few years. I texted Elle that I knew she had another work trip coming up next week and that when she got back, she wouldn't be welcome back in the house. Lucky for me she never came back. She moved in with a guy she'd been seeing down there, where they both lived in his brother's dining room since said guy was unemployed and living with his brother. Again gems. Her cheating life was a regular gem mine. I only saw her a few times after that. She signed the paperwork I sent her with next to no changes. I used the threat that her company would fire both her and her boss if I told them of the relationship they'd carried on if she tried to be difficult, which got me the house, my car, and less than half of the over $20,000 in credit card debt I didn't know she'd racked up. Also, none of my retirement accounts got touched, which is a blessing. 
She came back to Ohio to sign the paperwork in December 2019 and brought her new guy, which was about as awkward as you'd expect. A new guy seemed to think that I was at fault for the divorce for being abusive and he was there in case I got violent. Again, I had never hurt her and that includes when she'd get violent with me. I'd just pin her arms and wait for her to stop trying to hit me. I never told him that she cheated on me because I'm pretty sure he was one of the guys she did it with so I'm thinking he already knows. The other time she came back for her stuff that was still in the house while I watched her pack up. A few months had passed. She told me she got a new apartment and that new guy had moved in without asking. She found out when he was helping her move and sat the urn with his dead dad in it on her table. She gave me a weird to help me look and I just laughed. After that, I didn't see her again. Within a week of the divorce, I got coldly approached by a girl at a concert and got her number, then again at a local event. Within a month, I was actively dating four people, all of whom were better than L in every way. My friend said that I had that fresh on the market vibe, lol. I was just happy for the first time in a very long time and it made it easy to attract people. I calmed down a bit on the dating, though I did have a few girlfriends. I doubled down on my workout routine. I went to Peru and hiked the Cordillera Blanca mountains and I almost got stuck there when C-19 hit. I got into my ancestry after a 23 and me test and found a weird little utopian commune that was founded by a guy with my last name, though it's mostly historical buildings now. L tried to stay in contact over the last few years, sometimes for actual important things, mostly just trying to keep me in her life somehow. I ignore it, though I've got some funny insights. Like how the new guy immediately started a fake proposing a multiple times a week, and it was freaking her out. She texted me once, saying that taxes suck as a single, so she's getting married for tax reasons. When she found out I had found someone and gotten engaged, she sent a congratulations card to the house that she had hand-painted herself, which immediately went in the trash or the fact that a new guy was recently diagnosed with MS. I don't see Elle sticking around and suddenly finding her caring side to take care of a dude 10 years her senior with a neurological issue. In August 2020, I encountered my current wife, C. She's amazing, she got out of a bad marriage with a guy who seems like a mirror image of Elle. We hit it off when I was talking with a buddy of mine and I said, I'm just looking for someone normal. She heard me, and we both looked at each other for a second with a funny me too, look, we got married after two years of dating this past September, and we've never even fought once in the last year. She takes care of me, I take care of her, we talk every day, and it's always beautiful. It's really tough to describe, but she's the one. I'm doing much better now. I look back on all that, on literally half of my life, and wonder why I stayed for so long and through so much, especially when it was so easy to find someone so perfect afterwards. If any of you have made it this far and are currently in a bad relationship and wondering what to do, I get it. I think most of us get it. You put up with stuff that you think you never will. You think that this person you've put so much effort into can't be doing this on purpose. You'll excuse anything next to anything. You actively make yourself into a doormat. It's not worth it. Just get out, because whatever led to cheating once, it'll happen again and again after that. Cheaters will tell themselves whatever they need to do not feel bad about themselves and their actions. They will always justify it, to themselves and to you, and you'll always wonder what they're doing when they're not with you. You deserve better. So leave, cut losses, and do whatever you need to. My hang-up on divorce and low self-confidence kept me in it way longer than I ever should have, and nothing that happened in the relationship in the years after I found out helped me in any way. The only person that can get you into a better headspace is yourself, focusing on you and the people that actually care about you. It gets better once you leave.